Hello, I'm Kathy Nash with the ACES staff. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is entitled Introduction to Open Refine. It's sponsored by DCMI. Our distinguished presenter is Elizabeth Wicks from the University of Illinois. Our moderator is Inkyung Choi. She's also from the University of Illinois. I want to ask the audience, as you have questions today, you'll see a question panel box on your screen. Type your questions in there and Elizabeth will answer them uh, during the presentation as appropriate and any general questions she will answer at the end of the presentation. Now my pleasure to uh, turn the session over to Ink Young Choi, who's going to introduce Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ink Young Choi I'm from the University of Illinois at Barna Champaign. Uh, I'm currently serving on the DCMI Education Committee. Um, Dublin Core Metadata Initiative um, brings together a global community of the metadata practitioners, researchers, and developers uh, to share knowledge and advanced practice around metadata. So our webinar series is designed to share uh, the latest development in the best practice and the tools uh, and information related to metadata. So with uh, Karen Wickett, uh, who's also from the University of Illinois, uh, and also chair of the webinar task group on the education committee, we were able to make this fabulous webinar happen today. Um, so I, I really want to say that uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I also appreciate Kathy and then ACES the staff for arranging this webinar. Um, and now let me start introducing our speaker. Elizabeth Wicks. So Elizabeth Wicks, um, she is also from the School of Information Science at the University of Illinois, where she teach foundational programming and the information uh, technology courses. Um, she was previously a data curation specialist at, uh, for the research data services at the University Library of the University of Illinois. And then also uh, she was previously the curation manager for uh, UFRAM ARPA. And she is a certified carpentry instructor and instructor trainer. So she will give an introduction to Open Refine uh, today's uh, webinar. So now I'll just turn my mic to Elizabeth. So let her start. All right, hello everyone, whatever time zone you're in, uh, welcome. Uh, and let's go ahead and start with a little bit of open refine. I have a few slides to get going with at first, and then we'll just do some live open refine together. So, hi, uh, she said my name, and um, I'm here at Illinois at the iSchool. I'm a librarian by training, so I have my library science degree, and but I've always focused a little bit on the technical end, and now I get to teach both um, programming stuff and um, uh, pro, like project-oriented data programming classes, and so we metadata and talk about documentation and reproducibility, and that's just all really fun and awesome. So, um, you may have seen some of these things and these icons. I stole this slide from another slide deck from the previous workshop series I helped teach at, and um, so like we have, you may have some Python stuff going on. You may have like the natural language toolkit. You may have some Excel. You may have SQLite. Um, oftentimes when we are on the road toward or the end or hopeful some sort of end game for our research, we need to go through a bunch of different things. So for example, things might start off as a PDF and then you extract data out of it and then you might need to sort of get it around before you can even begin your analysis. So open refine is like one of the tools. Um, Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn off my webcam because the this building's internet is being funky today. So I have everything else. So oh, I can get that. So I was teaching Python this morning. So yeah, my computer is full of Python. <laughs> so I can shut down. So Open or Fun is just one of the many tools that you might use along the way toward your um, towards your research. And so what I'm hoping today is show you 
like what you can do with open refine. So you can use it to explore data, use it to sort of correct results. So for example, if you have a free text field um, for a survey data or something you may, and you got a thousand participants, you may want to go through those results and try to at least reconcile them down to a few uh, unique results in there just for your analysis. Um, there are various services and things to help actually more formally reconcile data back to different databases and data stores. Those can be very domain specific. Um, some th there are name authorities, there are genomic stuff as well. I was just playing around this morning with some, um, some book open library ones because I have some books I'm trying to connect uh, to. Um, Library of Congress. So there's a variety of things you can do and it can open up a bunch of different kinds of files. Now, just because I can open them doesn't mean it's going to be perfect or it's going to look sort of like what you expected, but it can, okay? So this isn't like a one-stop place. You do have to be mindful about how it sees data and how it wants to work with things, but it's usually a great jumping off point for if you've got some sort of messy data with some oddities in it, and you either want to explore and document the oddities, or you want to actually go in and correct them, Open Refine is a really great tool to do that. So mostly it's going to be optimized for working with tabular data, so like tables of data with proper like sort of CSV files, but it can open Excel as well. Now, if you've been to any sort of library carpentry or other data or software carpentry workshop, and they've maybe talked about spreadsheets, um, if you've used highlighting or um, conditional formatting or some such thing for uh, as important parts of your data, that's not going to transfer to other stuff really well or at all. And so uh, I definitely encourage you to explore other ways of handling that um, if you are in a position where it needs to get ported out to something else. Um, while it can do JSON and XML and a couple other kinds of data files, um, I caution you not to get too dreamy with this one because, for example, I had about 2,000 XML files that I wanted to open up and do some cleaning on, and it just didn't work. <laughs> like, if you have smaller ones, it's great. If you have a smaller corpus, that's great. But at a certain scale, open or find tops out. It's not a perfect program. There's a little, there's a few oddities here and there for it. It is open source. Um, and so, but it's not perfect. So um, I want to sort of show you like, but it's really, really good and, very, and like unique for what it does really well. So my focus here for this, and don't be presuming you're like eating lunch or like trying to answer email while I'm talking. And so that's fine. So this is not a quiz bowl sort of thing. Um, there's tons of stuff. I really want to highlight some of the main features for you and where they are in the program mostly so you know what's possible to do with this program so that you know some of the limitations within the that open refine has and if it does come to a day where you're like oh, open refine problem this is i'm going to open refine for this you sort of know when you open it up where to look for things and sort of where to find things when you're ready to try it on your own i will be using the library carpentry open refine introduction materials and i'll be kind of flipping through those and highlighting certain elements of them um, while we have our time here together today and so uh, there will be more but if you like, yes this is amazing this is exactly what i need i need to know all of these things there is um there are materials you can go to and use on your own after the fact and so and they're basically they're community curated so um they're pretty good they've got lots of data examples you can use so my main point is just to sort of show you sort of what this thing is and how you might you might approach it um oh, I'll show that a bit later all right so first up we're going to open up our applications in here when you install it um installing it can be kind of funky but eventually it'll become an application on your computer and you double click to open it, however you do on your Windows or Mac. One thing about it is that it is a web service, sort of, it's a local web service. So it will open up in a web browser. So if you look over here in my taskbar, if I can move it over here, you'll see that it has appeared down here. So it will have a little up 
application thing. But if you click on that application, you're not going to see anything really show up. You're just going to have this sort of thing because that's launching an interface inside of your web browser. So this is not on the internet necessarily. This is a local host. We, we look at the IP address, like this is your local computer. This is your local machine. It's not like, I can't, I'm not a cybersecurity person, so I'm not going to say any more than that, but like, this is not something that's being broadcast to the internet necessarily. Would I put HIPAA data in here? I don't, maybe not, because I wouldn't touch, I wouldn't do anything sketchy with HIPAA data like that. I don't know. If you have HIPAA data, you should talk to your HIPAA compliance advisor on that. Um, but probably IRB data should be okay. Like, no, you know your own computer. But anyhow, you don't need an internet connection to use this. It's just something launched. If you ever use Jupyter Notebooks locally or Jupyter Lab, it's the same sort of thing. This is becoming a really common way for applications to be shared because the like web browsers are honestly the only standard operating system that we have. And so for a lot of open source programs, it's a little bit easier for them to support and develop things when all they have to do is sort of fight with the JavaScript and the HTML to make it display nicely in a regular web browser rather than trying to like have something supported for Windows, Mac, Unix, et cetera. Um, so this is becoming a more common thing. It can confuse and scare your systems administrators depending on what's going on and how conservative they are. Definitely if you're working with more sensitive data, you should check things out a little bit more and confer with them. Um, so this can throw off permission problems if, depending on how they have set up your laptop. So when you first open it up, you're met with this, this interface in here. What we've got is, but the main thing that you want is opening up a data file. So you're gonna be met with this option to choose your local file, um, but you can also put in a URL, you can copy data, you can have a couple other options for reading things in. When you, let me move this window a little bit over here. If you look over here, we've got open project as well. So if you have a project you've already created and you wanna open it up, um, you can click open. You can also import a project if someone emails you and there's other settings as well. We're gonna be starting off with um, this computer and choosing a file to open. And so we've got, let's see here, I want my data because it's not saved in a great place, but you know, that's fine. Um, where'd you go? Okay, let's look in here. So this is the lesson that I'll be using today. It is from Library Carpentry Opener. It should be in the information about the webinar as well. It's got under setup, it's got the data file that you can download. So if you wanna work through this on your own, you can download that. Um, it's gonna show up like this. It's gonna be, depending on your web browser preferences, you can do just command press to save. If, oh, wait, I made an actual folder because I was slightly organized, didn't I? So I'm gonna go ahead and save this and just replace it in case I messed with it. Anyhow, so. When you get that, you can download it or wherever you know your thing is. So you can go to documents, open refine. So we can find our data file. This is a CSV file of articles and some things. I'm not sure how fake it is or not. So you find your file and you click next. Um, if it's really big, it may take some time. So you're met with this screen when you are after you've read it in. It allows you to kind of control how it's importing things. So there's a couple of things I wanna highlight. First, you can control how it parses stuff. Let me close this so we can see a little bit more. So you see we have a bunch of different file options. Now, before you start committing yourself to like, oh, OpenRefine can open XML files, so like I can definitely do all that data cleaning of those XML files. You should play with an, a sample or two of your XML files just to make sure that it's read things correctly. So you can mess with encoding stuff. You can open up all kinds of things. Um, it's worth playing with these with example data just to make sure that the way you formatted stuff, it loads okay. Most of the time, I my, in my experience, I have used CSVs and things like that. Um, but it does work nicely with fixed width data. 
as well, which uh, can be notoriously annoying to work with in Excel or Python. And so do it in Pandas, but it's kind of annoying. Um, most of the time we use CSVs. And the CSV sort of default worldview is that the first row is going to be the headers. And then we've got columns of properties. And then we have rows of entities. And each cell then is sort of the answer to what is this property? for this particular entity. Um, the reason I had that big caution about JSON and XML is anytime you get into sort of a tree structure of data uh, where you can have one to many different values, like you see here with authors, as soon as you try to represent that in a table, things get kind of funky. And so depending on your data, depending on how nested it is, the funkiness can just be overwhelming and maybe it's not the right kind of tool or you need to have someone just run a CSV report off your database. Um, you know your stuff the best, so I'm gonna leave that to you for how you wanna do things. So this screen, um, a lot of people sort of get mixed up when they're first starting to use it, like, oh, the data is right in and I wanna start exploring it. No, 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 you're still importing it. It's just giving you all of the options for how you might want to. I have seen some CSV files that have 10, the first 10 rows have documentation and the 11th is where the headers are. So you can say you wanna ignore a certain number of lines. Um, and then after that, you wanna parse a line as uh, column headers. Um, and there's just a bunch of different ways to sort of limit how you're loading it up. Um, the default ones that it comes with are usually pretty good. You want to just parse the first line as the headers. You want quotes to be the separators. Those are the pretty standard ways. If you've written out, if the data has been written out by a standard CSV parser, those are going to be safe. Those are going to be fine. Um, you can tell it, go ahead and see. If you see a number, try to do number things with it. And then it's going to try and have those data types. If you have a custom separator, if you've got, um, uh, a bunch of like web form data that people have typed in. You might want to go ahead and click this, which is the trim leading and white, leading and trailing white space from strings. So what'll happen is if someone say was typing in an author name and they had an extra space here at the beginning or at the end, it'll go ahead and trim that off. Uh, I think this is more of a pro programmatic data set, but I'm sure you have all seen that. Um, if you need to mess with it, there's all kinds of other stuff that you can do. So once you're happy with things, and the nice thing is as soon as you change it up here, you'll actually see the results in here. And so it's not perfect, you know, you may need to go back and forth, um, but once you've gotten it, it's pretty good. So you wanna go ahead and give it a reasonable project name. So we're gonna say like article cleaning or something like that. And you can tag it if you have like multiple kinds of projects, but you're gonna click create project. Now the trick with this is behind the scenes, it is not actually editing your original file. It's not even saving the open or find file in the folder. It has its own separate system. So when it imports the data, it's read it in and made a copy of it, it made a copy of it within open or find project. So I can make changes to here, I can muck around pretty, easily, if I destroy it too badly, I can actually go and reread the data, which is really, really handy. Um, it has really good undo redo that we will see as we go. So once you get to this point here, um, let's see here. Once you get to this point here, you are actually looking at the data. This is how it's being represented in OpenRefine. Um, you'll see here, you kind of always want to get used to glancing at or seeing how many rows do I have? And if you know you have about a thousand rows, then you're good. But if you know you have like 5,000 rows and it's only showing you 50, you've probably got a filter on. So that's why I say get a, get used to trying to look at up here to make sure that you're actually seeing everything. Um, you can also just choose how many records you want to display. Maybe they're very long and you only want to see a few. So don't freak out if you're like, I only seen the first five data points. Well, it's probably on purpose. You can see all of it if you need, if you click on all of them, but it's gonna run a little bit slower, just depending on what's going on, okay? So we're gonna just click on 10 because that's usually you know, what we wanna see. 
So um, we see there's pages of data, as we have open export, and we'll get to all of those things as we go. You'll also see this special column over here. It hasn't added anything to the data. This is just open or fine. Um, having its own little meta things. You can star and flag data for filtering. Um, so that is sort of how you use them is up to you. So if you want to star something that you've reviewed and is good, you can just click that and star it. Um, if you want to flag something of like, oh, that's going to be a problem and we're going to have to fix that one later on, you can flag it. Um, however you use it for your project, you should probably document it. Um, but they can be really good for um, doing different kinds of filters and things. So if we go ahead and you saw me make those changes, and if you maybe were looking, were looking closely, you maybe saw this undo redo count go up. So if you click on undo redo, you see a couple of different things like star row four, flag row three, unstar row four, and star flag row three. So, or on there we are. This allows you to sort of click back and select, okay, let's go back to this. And so you can kind of preview changes and stuff. It's not quite as powerful as sort of if you're messing around with GitHub or something, you've got like, oh, I want to undo that particular commit. You kind of have to roll back linearly to the very beginning. But if you mess around with stuff, you can always just go back to the original version and then just start over. The nice thing about this is also once you've done this for a while, if you want to have some quick and easy documentation, you can also click extract and um, you can actually output a data file of all of the changes that you've made, which is not necessarily a readable thing in the world, but it's there if you really, really need it. So if you're like, oh, did I manually update that particular value or was that value updated? via a larger query on something, you can go through it and check for that. So we're going to click back over here into facet and filter. You can hide this if you got a smaller screen with this little arrow here. So you can expand and collapse that. A lot of times you're going to be working, you're going to want this space in here. Okay, so that's how you can open and read data, get things loaded in. Um, we're going to start exploring some of the essential and powerful tools of this now. Um, if you have questions along the way, as far as like when I kind of shift topics and stuff, go ahead and throw them in to the chat and Inky is, is checking them and she'll interrupt me if there are um, like relevant questions to like what I'm talking about right now versus general. Okay. So as we start reading through this and you can make this a bit bigger just by making your browser, your browser page bigger. Um, I'm going to set it back to more normal. It does end up quite small, just depending on what's going on. Um, but you can sort of mess around with things a little bit. So what's also nice is that it also uh, kind of automatically detects if it's a URL. Um, I missed where the data set demo came from. Oh, the data set that I'm using came from the lesson that, I'm, that this is based off of. And if you go into setup for the lesson, it's always kind of hidden, but the data that I'm using is in here. Okay. Ooh, let me go back to my page. Okay. So we've got, um, oh, 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 oh. so if you look over here by the titles, by the headers for each, I can make this go away so we can make this a bit teeny bit bigger. If you look here by the headers, you'll see little drop downs. And if you've messed around enough with Excel, you might find like, oh, that's kind of similar to if you're swinging and filtering data. So it's sort of like that, except it's like a lot more powerful and like way less annoying to use. Um, so if you click on these, you're gonna get access to a bunch of different stuff. So there's two basic kind of things you can do to the content in Open, to the content in Open Refine. We can make changes that edit content and of all of the cells, or you can make changes that edit the entire column. Um, or Open Refine sort of organizes everything at the cell or the column level. When you're trying to find stuff, you may not be able to accurately predict whether or not it's an, a column or a cell item. Just remember, if you can't find it in one of them, check the other, okay? 
So if we look here in authors, for example, we can see that there's like a separator here for authors and maybe we wanna actually break those apart because we wanna do a filter on something. Um, so it's nice that we have like, the language here kind of separated. We, know we have some cleaning issues happening. Um, but we can easily kind of filter on the different languages we want. Um, but on the authors, because the authors are all kind of put together with this little separator, we can't necessarily do a really powerful query on it. But you can if you go into, um, into here, and we'll, we'll explore a lot of these as we go. Um, but we can look at edit cells. Um, so now this is one that I would personally probably put in edit column. But edit cells has these split multi-valued cells, okay? So if you go in here and click multi split multi-valued cells, this allows you to break it apart. I know you might be thinking, look, I've done this in Excel and it makes a whole bunch of columns off to the right and it looks absolutely terrible. You are 100% right. It does look absolutely terrible. OpenRefine handles it a little bit better. Um, so you can have a bunch of different options in here. I put this in um, by separator. So we know that the separator, because we've looked at the data, is this pipe key. So you can put in a pipe, you can put in regex if you need. There's a lot of different options going on. Um, if it's like multiple characters of a separator, you can put that in as well. And I'm gonna click OK. And what it ends up doing is when it splits it off, it actually adds sort of this extra little row. Now it's not actually an extra row. OpenRefine still knows that, um, still knows like this stuff responds to like this data here. Um, but it's nice because then you can actually see and act on the author names independently, clean those up and then put them all back together as you want. So we've got that situation going on. And of course, if you're like, oh no, that was the wrong one. You can go back to undo redo and click that to make it all go away. Okay, so let's undo that for now and focus a little bit on um, clustering, which is the other super powerful thing, okay? So if we go back over here to language, um, this language column has clearly like this sort of full, full word of English plus the abbreviation in here. There's like some construction happening next to my office. But if we click on language and we can take another look in here, we see this option for facet. And when we hover over that, we see text facet, numeric facet, timeline, scatterplot, et cetera. So facets allow us to see the unique values in here and see how many there are. Um, if you've done this in Excel, you've looked at like filter and you can click the drop down and see all the unique values and then just click the ones that you wanna see. Um, the problem is though, like you, it's really hard to kind of keep that around or know how many. Um, so this is a much more powerful kind of version of that. Because I have text data, I'm going to say text facet, but if I had numeric data actually stored numerically, it can do numeric things. And it just, what this does is it has, excuse me, like different viewpoints into the data depending on that data type, okay? Now, if you have a numeric label that's not actually a number and you do a numeric facet, it may not look super great, but um, yes, yeah, so we're going to click on text facet and this part over here on the left is going to reappear. Um, and you're like, oh, where's the thing? Well, I need to click back over here. I'm still in undo redo. I need to click back over here into filter facet or facet filter. And so already we see a really awesome results in here. I mean, they're kind of messy data, but like it's really awesome to see. Here are all of the unique values. We see that there's four choices. There's an extra one here that's blank, but we also see a count of how many of each there are and we can sort it by name we can also sort it by count so how many so the most popular ones you can imagine this being valuable if you have like 500 different language values in here and you just want to look at like what are the biggest ones maybe you don't know how the data was formatted and you don't know if the um primary values like the main chunk of values are in one format versus in another so that might be my why you might want to count Okay, so we can sort of see we have 871 instances of EN, 107 instances of English, seven of ES, and one of FR, and then 15 blank ones. Um, you can 
also sort of say edits so you can edit this value if you just want to edit it directly like you know that english should have been en you can click edit and edit that value directly and it'll upload it um commas as separators for names uh when you're also using commas to separate first names last names um if you yeah so going back into the names if you had used commas for everything that is going to be a much more difficult it doesn't know what a name is and so you are going to need to do a little bit more work to figure out how to separate those there isn't necessarily a magic tool for it maybe it's always like j period comma is going to be the actual space um so if we edit this if, and you had something like, I don't know, <laughs> but if you if, if a wall was, ugh, if it was always no, undo that. So something like Aslam N comma Lin C comma. So in this case, if it looks like this, and you split on commas, yes, you would end up with. Aslam and win C is so false. But depending on it, if it's if there is a more unique separator, you know that like period space, like period comma actually separates the names, then you could put in period comma as a separator. It just really depends on the data. It's not so it can't magically detect names in there. Um, it is kind of brute force, but it can get you into a place once you figure it out. Um, there's other ways to transform it as well. You don't always have to do it that way. Um, it just really, really, really depends on how you have that data formatted. Okay. So you can just edit the name right here um, if you want to do that. You can also click cluster. There's nothing super interesting necessarily about cluster. But what we can go ahead and do is resolve all these English values into EN. So we're going to go ahead and change this just directly to EN and click apply. And so now we can see here that those values have all been changed. And I see I have 978 going on. Um, now, and then I can always go back and check which ones that have been have been changed so i can accept that and i'm going to go ahead and close so you can close and then um the underscore doodad is sort of minimized in here and then if you want to just close this you can click close okay so there's lots of different facets you can do like if you only wanted to see a blank one so let's go back to this and say like oh wait i really want to I'm curious about blank cells. If you actually click here on the blank and then kind of collapse this, it'll actually filter and show you just the rows that have the blank language. So maybe you're like, oh, this one is in English because I know this article. I don't actually, but I can fake it. So I can actually type in EN and say apply. And so I can edit. We apologize for the uh, technical difficulties. Um, I'm hoping Elizabeth will be able to rejoin us soon. So if you'll just stand by, I'm asking her to try to rejoin the presentation and use her telephone for audio. Um, so stand by and uh, we'll hope to get the session going again in a minute. All right, I can hear you. Okay, there we go. Of course, this is like the two days of the entire semester that this can't that this building has had internet blips. Um, okay, so um, if we go in, yeah, let's back up. 
Um, I had just talked about um, editing the cells individually, and then you can sort of see them in here. Um, and then you can click on one of the values to filter it to see just those particular values. So we can see one thing to check, again, if you kind of like go get a coffee at this point and come back, um, the problem is you may not remember what you had done and you're like, oh, where's all the data, right? So there's a couple of clues to give you an idea that like you filtered here. So first off, we can see the row numbers aren't uh, lining up. We go from 10 to 18 to 38. And so we know that like we've, we're missing some data. We can also see up here that it's changed to say we have 14 matching rows out of a thousand total, okay? So if we back out out of this, um, we wanna go ahead and just kind of remove that. Fill to that whole little box pod thing, we'll remove the filter and we're back to all of our data. Let's go ahead and talk about cleaning up data now that we've split it up, okay? So we have authors, we're gonna go ahead and edit cells and we're gonna split it by this pipe in here and click okay. And the nice thing is it's gonna keep it connected to this prior row here, but allow me to sort of look at it independently, each of the names independently. So you can go ahead and do facet, text facet. And of course we expect for a thousand articles that there's gonna be a ton of different names. And so we can kind of already see over here, there's like a little extra white space happening. It's harder to see on the other end, but you'll see like the number sometimes sticking out. Um, you can see that of these thousand articles, that you know there's actually like 4000 now rows from having the, the authors split apart and then there's 20 about 2500 unique values so even just that one action actually gives me a bunch of metrics to see and so those are a couple of values that you might want to um, take note of in there okay so here i might want to say okay i can maybe clean some of this up by trimming the leading white space off of it which remember we did do for the whole data file, but we didn't, but it only looked at the beginning and the end, not necessarily inside. So if we go into authors, we can do edit cells, um, common transformations. Uh, that is going to have a whole bunch of the great goodies in here. So trim leading and trailing white space, collapse consecutive white space. So the trim treating and trailing, leading and trailing is that white space at the very beginning and end. Collapse consecutive is maybe they put like a bunch of spaces in the middle of something, okay? So we can actually go ahead and do both. So I'm gonna do trim treating and lighting. And what you should watch is to see if this 2,509 changes. So we're gonna do trim treat, whoa, did not mean to zoom in there. Thanks mouse. So we fixed one, so that's good. So let's go ahead and do the um, edit cells, we're gonna, collapse consecutive white space that didn't change anything so then i think we can be pretty um let's see, let me get my notes back open in, in here um so once we see like oh okay there's a bunch of ones in here well how about i do count i'll click count and i can see okay here are how most names are formatted in here so you can see like the top person mentioned in this um in this grouping in here. Now we know names are super complicated, right? And so we should not always presume that something that doesn't conform to our standards of names is actually a bad name or an invalid name. Um, I always try to go back to the original uh, paper or something like that to sort of figure out like, if they formatted it like that in the paper, then yeah, that's probably like how they wanna format their name because names, are complicated and beautiful in their complexity, but difficult with data. And so don't be always mindful that you should not always accept something as a typo just because you haven't seen it done like that before. So we can actually start exploring this cluster button here, which is the thing that most people just really love about OpenRefine. So if you click cluster, in here, there's a bunch of different items. One warning with this is if you have your thing zoomed in, you're gonna not see all of the stuff. Um, that's an oddity that um, that's just, I haven't figured out a way around it. And this is the updated version. It's just a funkiness to it. Um, so what this is doing, it has a bunch of different algorithms happening 
in here. And so you can change the different algorithms for how it might cluster things. Some of them look for, like here is saying, okay, well, this one appears to be missing a period there. This one, the name is kind of flipped. So it's saying, well, these two appear to maybe be the same. Do you wanna merge them with the same value? So here we can maybe say, yeah, okay, this one looks good. Um, uh, but I actually think it, it should have the I, is it the I acute, I think, in here. So we can go ahead and type that one. And so you can edit them if you do not want the proposed change in here. You can edit the change to be whatever it is. I think it takes like the most common one. So like for this one, this one has nine rows and this one has one row. And so it's proposing to change it with the nine one with the, the most popular one. Um, but you can change it to be something else if you want. And if you do want that change, you just click the button, okay? What it doesn't allow you to do is necessarily document why you're merging them, okay? Um, or document like, yeah. So it doesn't necessarily let you document why you're making that choice in there. And so it will document that they were changed to that value. And so you will still wanna take notes one other trick you can do is like open up a Zoom session or something and just record your screen and record yourself talking through why you're making these changes. Um, so, you know, if you did need to know why, you would have to go digging through it, but at least you know it's there. And that way you don't have to worry about like taking notes necessarily if you've got a ton of these things to do. So for this one, I'm gonna say, yep, that's good as well. For these, you know, I don't know, like, um, it could be very well a different person. You know, if I knew this data better, I might be able to say, I'm not really sure, you know, this, this punctuation here. I'm gonna say this one's probably correct because we have the single apostrophe and then the back tick happening. And that's a pretty common encoding problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose that one and the rest I'm gonna leave the same. Um, over here, it's gonna give you a nice little sort of um, readout to kind of give you an idea of like what's going on. Um, and you can actually filter things from there if you want to like only see ones that have the short names or how many rows there are. This is not necessarily the most interesting in here. But if you click merge, select it, and recluster here at the bottom, it'll do that and then it'll rerun the algorithm. And sometimes you'll get new stuff. So this one, the key collision with fingerprint, is usually the pretty like the most conservative one you can do. But you can also do, there's others that get a little bit more um, open to how many things there could be. So here we have at least this name. I don't know if it's necessarily the same person. I'm not doing saying that, but these should probably be formatted the same in here. And so let's go ahead and accept that with the thing there. That I can't say necessarily. And then you see here, those are probably different names. I don't know, but those are probably different names. So I'm gonna leave those alone. Again, names are hard. So if, again, if you merge select it, it'll redo it again. And you can kind of keep playing with these. Some of these will do um, by sound as well. So they're saying like, oh, these are probably said really similar. This one can get really tricky because especially, I think it was trained on English data. And if you have um, names that are not necessarily said using English pronunciations, um, the model just kind of breaks down and gets really confused. And so it starts suggesting lots of things based off of that train data. And as we know, you shouldn't use train, like you shouldn't train data on the wrong stuff. So sometimes it's super useful, sometimes it's not. It really depends on what kind of data you're looking at in here. Um, yeah, especially the phonetics. So you can kind of play with that. If you've got really big data, if you've got a lot of stuff happening in here, See here now, it's just the letters have changed. Well, it's probably a different person in there, okay? So you want, you want to be careful not to just like accept everything, okay? Unless you really know your data very well. So we can go ahead and close that and you see that our choices have gone down and it has put all those values in there. Then I can actually go into edit cells and I can say join multi-valued cells and I'm gonna join them back with this pipe that I had originally used. And so now we have cleaned up those values separately. Um, we have documentation of like what was done. So we can see all of these different values. And then we've been able to put them all back together again with the same pipe. And so if you are 
um, I'm sort of speaking to like a library audience, but like if you have run a query on a database or a developer did for you and they sent you the Excel spreadsheet and they are expecting the same format to come back after you've been cleaning it, you can break it apart, clean it, and then reassemble it back in the way that they wanna accept it back in. Um, so it's 12, well, it's N45 if you are in uh, one of the plus one time zones, if you're in one of the 30 minute time zones, it's 15, N15 for you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to go through. I did want to highlight that this lesson, there's a lot more of this lesson. It is open access. It's free to use. It's free to read through. There's activities and things. There's a ton of stuff you can do with OpenRefine. There's a ton of different query languages you can get for it. There's like a, a like Google Refine open language or something like that. Uh, you can actually put in different Python. Um, if you want to edit cells, transform, you can actually kind of put in Python in here if you need. Um, there is like a, a Grel language that's like internal to um, internal to OpenRefine. Um, you can find books on that. They're not super common. There is a reasonable amount of like Stack Overflow kind of stuff for these things. Um, but what's cool is like you can kind of mess with it using Python if you need. So you can say like dot split on um, pipe. Um, and what's also really cool about this is it'll show you as you're developing it, what it'll look like. And so if you've, if you've messed it up or if it's got an error, it'll show you pretty nicely. So we can do that and like get the first one and then like split that on a, not spit, but split. that on a white space, then just do other dumb things like whoop, reverse it, right? And then like rejoin it. So you can sort of whack in little Python things in here to mess with the data a little bit. Don't do not do this though, that's bad. Um, but yeah, that's how you can do other things in there. Um, so it's really powerful. There's lots of stuff out there. And yeah, I'm open to other questions now. I'm just going to go over to um, Inkyung, who's been monitoring the questions. And hopefully my audio has gotten a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's better um, now. Um, I just uh, spot some questions that I think maybe can be addressed really quick. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, so, well, about the browser, the uh, web browser mm -hmm. uh, from OpenRefine, um, are there like any way to tell the OpenRefine like which browser to use? I think it'll go with your default system browser. Um, the full system browser. Mm -hmm. So, like whatever, so if your system default to open to opening web pages, you should be able to copy this. So, if it opens up in Chrome or whatever, so like if you have multiple on there and your default is different than the one you actually want to use, you should be able to just copy this URL and then open that up mm -hmm. in the your other web browser and paste it. And um, like Safari. Should probably, yeah. nope, don't open, okay, well, I was trying to open Slack, I'm not super sure. But if I copy this and paste it, I've never done it, but I'm pretty sure that should work. Yeah, so that can work and then you can close Chrome. Okay, so on the uh, web page of the, in the library carpentry for the Open mm -hmm. Refine, it says Open Refine requires one of these web browser, including Google Chrome, uh, Chromium, Opera, Microsoft Edge, but looks like it still works in a, a Firefox, so does that matter? Like in um, I don't know it how much it matters. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, they just updated it. Sorry, I'm not sure exactly what it says. Um, mm. it's, it's it also depends on your system too. So, mm. um, let's see here. I'm trying to find the uh. Uh, the question in here, <laughs> so I can see the mm -hmm. the text in there. Uh, let me just sure. look at Open Refine. Uh, 
The frustrating thing about OpenRefine is that there's not really a good cloud option. And I'm used to like, there's mm -hmm. always some cloud-based option for stuff because of, of um, uh, let's see here, installation instructions. Yeah, so it probably still works with Firefox just depending mm -hmm. on stuff, but there's, but probably, like it says it works best, not works only. It probably has some funky bugs in Firefox in um, some of the features. So um, if you're stuck with Firefox, probably you'll be okay. Um, just expect mm -hmm. oddities in there, but like, I don't think mm -hmm. it'll destroy the data necessarily, if that helps. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, well then um, it's a little bit like a general, but um, the question you can also address it really quick. Um, well, can you just elaborate the when, uh, what, the, what do you mean by just simply parse? Oh, parse means um, yep. read it over understanding the formatting. So um, mm. when there's quotes and commas and stuff, um, it'll say like, oh, I know what that is. And I'm gonna say like, oh, that's a cell and that's a cell and that's a cell. Um, and there's lots mm -hmm. of different parsers out there. So for example, mm -hmm. like when you open up a JSON file or an XML file in Chrome and it sort of displays it nicely, that's it actually mm -hmm. parsing that data file and then displaying the content correctly. So parser is just sort of like a formatting aware reading of the file is how I would mm -hmm. define that very generally. Probably some people would fight me over that. No. Thank you. Um, and then I think this question also uh, you can uh, answer quick. Um, so uh, Jennifer uh, asked, could we work with OpenRefine if we use OCLC, uh, WordShare, WordShare management services, so uh, WMS? I don't know. I'm not an expert in that place. OCLC is a grand mystery. I am, have not worked. I do not know. I would ask, uh, I can Google that for you, but um, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if OCLC has, um, oh, here, someone, you're not the only one. I don't know what the answer is, <laughs> but um, OCLC has its own thing. Oh, that's actually cool. Um, so oh, yeah, apparently yeah. you can, and now as far as the WMS, I'm not sure you will. So clearly this is not their only conversation they've had. So you might need to ask your OCLC team that mm. I do not know in either direction, but it looks like there's something in there, so. Okay, that's that's good to know. Um, and another question from Elizabeth Pascal, um, is there one place where user of OpenRefine share commonly used Python scripts? Um, there have, I've seen some when I've Googled stuff. Um, uh -huh. It's usually more snippets uh, mm -hmm. than I've seen. Yeah, so there's some, um, I've seen some forums, but I don't remember any. I don't think there's like a single place. There is open or find documentation, um, so you can get, some Python snippets in there. Um, there might be mm. some like domain specific ones, but there, I don't believe there's like a single place. So you, it's just mm. gonna be catch as you can it with Google mm. results. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and then there are a couple more like a technical question. Um, like um how do you export the cleaned up data back out to excel oh yeah great question so in here you click ex export and you have a bunch of different options which is pretty cool um i particularly like that you can export out to sql and a couple of database things um but yeah you just pick the one that you want um you can do csv mm -hmm. or you can click excel or um, one of the open spreadsheet things and yeah, and so you can pick any of those. The HTML table can be pretty fun as well because it's something that like can display kind of nicely. I've even like done it where, cause I have an XPath writer thing. Oh, it doesn't work on local sometimes. Um, I can like, I've written like little XPath queries on stuff, but yeah. 
So that's mm -hmm. uh, where the export is. Remember that you have to actually want to like save it, like so you can read it into R or Python or something. You will need to export it as CSV is preferable because that's a little bit more transportable in there. Um, um, I think in a similar sense, um, Julia asked about um, how about re-importing the data? Oh, importing it again. Uh, if you go into yeah. sort of, if you click on the open or find thing up here, it'll take you back to, so the upper left on the little logo, it'll take you back to mm -hmm. the like opening screen where you can um, create a new project and reopen it that way. Um, all else fails, mm -hmm. if you quit and reopen it, it'll it'll start you here as well. Mm. Um, some other questions, um, like, Coming in here, uh, do you ship the between open refine and other environment like R for uh, different mm -hmm. cleaning manipulation task? Just, yeah, just, I just do. curious uh, from IME. Mean, yeah. And sometimes mm -hmm. I'll have students do that as well, where there's a big data set and there's like one column that you wanna that you wanna fuss over, and so I'll have them export that like one column, depending on if we need mm -hmm. the other stuff for context. Export that one column and then copy it and have a new one where you have all the edits and then save that file as like a sort of fake join table. So you mm. save that and then inside your program, like I'll read it in and then apply all those new values uh, to my data in the program and then keep going in there. And that mm -hmm. can like be a nice mm -hmm. like reproducible workflow. So yeah, um, mm -hmm. that, I, this is definitely for me an intermediate step when I'm cleaning data. Mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then while I was the best school, um, can I ask you to share your experiences? So do you have any personal experiences with open refine misreading data fields? Date fields, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it's it's a field. little bit better than Excel, but you know, if you've yeah. got, um, I've got this like letters data, um where are you it's from a finding aid um and where are you buddy you're in here somewhere it's just there's just a lot of stuff on my computer yeah um it can um if we go mm -hmm. back into open to here um you know, any date, if I chucked something funky in here, it's gonna just do its best. Mm -hmm. um, so you will have to be your same diligent self. It's not about dates. Uh, let's see here, common transformations, um, edit column, and you can change it to common transformations to date. And it'll kind of highlight that it's a date, so like mm -hmm. one problem is it's like oh clearly you meant at the beginning of the day well like yo that's an actual time zone and maybe i didn't mean like this actual time in here um mm -hmm. so it can still get funky you may want to just break it apart so keep it as text but then just like break it apart so here go undo and then you just click on the guy there break it apart into separate fields and then say that's the day, month, year, and that might be easier. It just depends on like the kind of data that you're, kind of dates. If you're dealing with like, mm -hmm. you know, 1900 and beyond, you're probably gonna be fine doing that. If you have like, oh, but all of the normal cataloging data, you are you might have some problems mm -hmm. there, so. But there are lots of good guides and stuff for dealing with dates and open or fine. This definitely is an improvement mm -hmm. that over Excel. Okay. Uh, I Good see this question know. from Sue as well. Can mm -hmm. you save a file? Sorry, I'm looking at the questions too. <laughs> yeah, go uh, ahead. <laughs> uh, so can you save a file or do you always need to export it and save it in another format? No, you will. You can save it. Um, so like I can, I can close this and like these mm -hmm. are all of my projects I've ever done over the course of, um, oh, here's those. Here's that one. I, of course, I already have it in here. Um, but you can see here date, like here's the date column in here and um, that it sells transform to date 
and it's just gonna like kind of barf on things. So at least if it doesn't know what to do about it, it won't try. Um, but it's still like, I don't think I meant like at midnight there. So, but yeah, um, it'll save the actual project itself will save on your computer. Um, but if you wanna open it up in, an, in another program, you will need to export it into a format that, that program can read. But yeah, I have projects on here from 2018. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth, and then thank you everyone um, for asking like great questions. I think uh, it's it's time to wrap up. Um, <laughs> so everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, and then Elizabeth, uh, thank you for a great talk uh, and then all the demonstration. I also learned a lot. Um, yeah, well, so that's that's for today. Elizabeth, do you have any like a remark to make? Um, other than this lesson is open and available. And so if you're curious about it, um, you can look at there and think about um, investigating the carpentries as well, because there are certified mm -hmm. instructors all over the place who can help lead a longer version of this sort of workshop. And thank you all for right, your well, questions. I want to really thank uh, Elizabeth. That was a, a fascinating webinar. Um, a lot of information, uh, and uh, we had a great audience and a lot of interaction. So that's terrific. And thank you as well, Ink Young, for doing a great job mod moderating uh, all of those questions. I do want to remind uh, the audience uh, that one of the uh, many ACES member benefits is complimentary access to all webinars. Uh, a recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides will be posted to the ACES website uh, and the DCMI's website. Um, and they're available to all ACES members and paid registrants. Uh, within 24 hours, you're gonna receive an email that's gonna include a link for the recording as well as a survey. And I encourage you to uh, fill the survey out and return it within seven days. Uh, your feedback is really important to all of us uh, in the future planning of webinars. Again, I'm Kathy Nash, I'm with the ACES staff, and I thank everyone for attending today, and I thank our presenter and moderator. This concludes today's thank webinar. You. Thank you.